thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I am going to start off with a few tips that I have, um, and they are just, of course, suggestions for you um, on playing, because um, toys and, and playing are really kind of secondary, and so if you can start with the right dynamics, it will hopefully be a positive experience for everybody involved. Um, so my first slide here is um, regarding the environment, and that's one of my tips, and of course this uh, funny e-card is here, um, and I think that everybody probably has this happen at their house um, all the time. You know, things just get displayed all over the house, and you know, you have socks in the living room, and you know, things that aren't where they should be, so um, it is kind of a funny little um, e-card to go along with the environment. Um, so on my next slide, I have some uh, under environment, I have three um, tips here, and that is focus and attention, organization, and rules of play or expectations. Um, so play is really happening in, it, happening in many different environments. You know, the kids might play in the living room, their bedroom, and of course right now we're really um, focused on um, being at a lot of holiday parties and things. So um, if there's a possibility to really prepare the environment beforehand, um, or the provide structure for the play activity that's going to happen, um, it may be less chaotic and more enjoyable for everyone. So as far as focus and attention goes, um, really if you can provide a space that is clear of clutter, and, and that kind of goes back to that e-card that I had up, um, you know, if you can if you can make the space clutter free, maybe noise and other distractions can be cleared away. Um, it would be easier to play. You know, it's, it's easy to keep the TV on, um, but not everyone can filter that background noise out. So, um, especially kids that have ADD and ADHD, it's going to be, um, you know, they're, they're going to be hyperactive anyway, and they're going to be potentially hyper-focused on the television versus the, the game that they just received from a holiday party or whatever that may be. So really lessening your distractions um, can be key. And then the next one is organization. So I mean organization of the actual product that is being played with, maybe the game, maybe um, you know some some kind of a product that has to be put together. You know, lots of toys have to be put together now. So make sure that the game has all the pieces. Um, it's going to be ready to work, uh, you know, shortly, and it's not going to take a long time to put together because that can, you know, be frustrating not only for the person putting it together, but the person waiting to play the with the toy or, or product that um, they are receiving. And then the last one here is kind of the rules of play. And I'm not really talking here about the rules of the game. I'm talking about the kind of the house rules for playing. Um, so really setting boundaries and limits provides structure um, for play, and it promotes independence for the child. So those are my tips for environment. And then on my next slide here, I have um, adaptations. And I thought this mouse pad was pretty funny. Um, that, you know, I don't need no stinking instructions. And a lot of people say that. You know, I know I've put together quite a few things um, from Ikea or maybe toys, and I'm like, oh, I don't need the instructions. Well, I really am telling you this time, you don't need the instructions. It's okay to not use the instructions that come with a board game or um, other products that children get for um, birthdays or holidays. Um, so really create your own rules and uh, make it fit the child's needs. Um, so I'm going to, for the next slide here, I'm going to use um, an example, and uh, the three points I have here are pieces, rules, and sounds. And my example is going to be, for these three points, is the game Lucky Ducks. And um, for any of you that don't know the game, um, it's kind of a matching game for younger kids, and each player gets a cardboard lily pad, and it corresponds to a color. So each color, each uh, lily pad is a color, and on the bottom of the ducks, they also have a little circle that has a color on it. Well, now the ducks are circling around a pond, and they're quacking, and they're moving, and they're creating a lot of chaos. So it can be a little over-simulating. Well, for pieces, do you really need all of the ducks in the Lucky Ducks game? Probably not. I mean, you could really just pick two colors um, and two lily pads, and then it will shorten the game, and it creates a 50-50 chance of getting the right color. Um, and you can always add more ducks when you think your child um, you know, can have a longer attention span and they're ready to handle the, the odds of getting the wrong colored duck, and, and that's okay. And then the next part for rules, um, do you really need your own lily pad? Maybe you lay out all the lily pads and all the ducks get to um, be on the pond, and when it's your turn, you pull a duck and you match it to the lily pad. So, you know, you're getting some color recognition there and matching, and, and you know, it's okay. It's turn-taking, um, so those are changing the rules up a little bit. And the last part is sounds. You know, lots of games come with sounds now, and they can be very annoying. So um, maybe just don't turn it on. Don't put the batteries in it so it doesn't even, you know, influence the child to try and turn it on. If there's no batteries in there and they can't, 
can't, you know, it's not going to make any noise, well, that's probably better for everybody because I know that in the Lucky Ducks game it can be very annoying to have those ducks just quacking, quacking, quacking and circling the pond. Um, and it doesn't affect the game, it doesn't make it any, you can still play the game if the ducks aren't quacking and moving around the pond. You know, you're still getting the fine motor and the matching to pick up the ducks off the pond and, and find where they go. Um, and so other ideas would, you know, be for different games, like maybe puzzles, you know, only put together so many pieces at one time and then come back. Or um, play a game like Monopoly, of course, everybody can, you know, has probably played that game and knows how long it is and you can come back to it. Um, just leave it where it lies and, and come back and play at another time. So those are some examples I have there for adaptations. Now my next slide here. I am talking about play time, and really the key word I have here is time. Um, all play does have to come to an end, so really helping kids understand that before play heart starts can be really helpful in the end for everyone. So the next slide, my points are going to be timers and clocks, transitions and schedules, um, and timers and clocks. This is, um, you know, important. Uh, timers really can be a great visual countdown system for a child. Um, maybe it goes off twice. One is a warning, one is it's the end, you know, whatever fits their needs best. Um, and then a clock could be, you know, or a watch can be a great way to provide a child that maybe is a little bit older um, and maybe uh, understands uh, telling time, um, a good way for them to be independent and uh, and handle their own time management skills and transitions. So at 2 o'clock, you know, it's time for me to start cleaning up, and by 2.15, I'm finished playing. And then as far as transitions go, obviously transitions can be difficult for anyone, but for a child with ADD or ADHD, um, this can be really difficult and, and really frustrating. Uh, you know, they may have been hyper-focusing on a toy or whatever they were playing with, and now the activity is just over with, um, which can obviously cause, uh, you know, a meltdown. So really, it's important to go ahead and allow time for a break in between activities. So maybe they were playing a board game, and in between, they really need to kind of mentally resolve that first task that they were doing, that, that they were playing, and prepare for the next thing, whether that's homework, or it's um, leaving the house they were playing at, or it's dinner time, whatever that may be. So in between, if they could, um, you know, use a trampoline, or, um, you know, something that they really can help calm down with and, and understand that, oh, in the in-between time, this is what's happening, and then I'm finished, and I'm moving on to the next thing. It can be really helpful. And then finally, schedules. Um, I love schedules. Um, I really like to know what's happening, especially, you know, throughout the day and throughout my week or month for work. And I think kids really benefit from that as well, especially kids with ADD or ADHD. Um, and it could be as simple or as detailed as needed for that child. So whatever works best for them is... Um, you know, what you, you could do for your child. Um, and of course, just as a final point, you know your kid and what they can, can and cannot handle. So the tips that I'm, I'm sharing here are just suggestions for play uh, to help manage the possible frustration levels on all parties involved and to make uh, play a pleasurable experience. Mm -hmm.